coming up on Marriage Today with Jimmy and Karen. In the way that I treated Karen, I didn't, I didn't pray about it. I didn't ask the Lord how to deal with my wife. I was not reading the Bible and doing what the Bible was saying in that particular area. If you're bent, there's only one way to get straight, and that is the influence of Jesus Christ. How does Jesus want you to deal with anger? How does Jesus want you to deal with money? In Exodus 34, 7, this is God keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquities of the fathers, and that really means parents, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. God says, I'm a merciful God, but the truth is the iniquities of parents are visited for three or four generations. The word iniquity uh, in the Hebrew language it is the word avon, and it just means to bend. It's like if you have a prevailing wind that blows from a certain direction, you see a tree that just begins to bend under the influence. That's the word iniquity. It just means you grew up under a certain negative influence, and under that negative influence, you developed a bent. And that means we all know that certain things run in families, that because of the influence of your parents growing up, and they have the most powerful influence in our lives, because of the influence of our parents, what they do, we tend to do. That's why we say the acorn doesn't fall far from the tree. It's because they are our most powerful role model growing up. And so let me give you some examples of family iniquities, things that we can develop a bent for in our lives. Anger. You know, everybody gets angry, but I'm saying there are families where they just yell all the time and everybody, no one knows how to deal with their anger. They're kind of an angry family. Substance abuse runs in families. Chauvinism, sexism, and racism. How did your parents deal with people of different races? How did your parents deal with people of the opposite sex? Those kinds of things. Uh, physical abuse, verbal abuse, sexual abuse, which many times is generational. Uh, family systems uh, pass these down. Bigotry, immorality, negativity, just being negative, uh, lack of faith, lack of belief those kinds of things. Perfectionism, uh, conditional love. I love you more if you make A's than if you make C's or D's. I, li I like you more, I love you more if you're the quarterback than if you're, you know, the water boy or whatever. Um, pride, unforgiveness, gossip. Do you have iniquities? Now again, I've never met a person that didn't have iniquities from their past. But here's some questions that you can ask in saying, do I have iniquities? Number one, were the things were you exposed to while you were growing up biblically sound and morally correct? Because see, the Bible is straight. When you say, well, what is straight? The Bible, the, the way God does things, the way God treats people, the way God deals with anger, uh, God's standards and values related to money and, and all of those things, that's straight. What's bent? Things that are not according to the word of God. If your parents didn't deal with things biblically and morally, it means they were bent. They had a bent away from the Word of God. The way people in your family resolve conflict. In my family, we, we didn't know how to deal with conflict, so we just, we just didn't make eye contact. Um, in our family, you knew, you knew how mad someone was based on how long they didn't look at you. We, we, we didn't know how to deal with it. We just, and we weren't yellers or throwers. Now, Karen's family is opposite, and, and that is when they got mad, oh my gosh, it, which, which I didn't know how to deal with because, you know, in my family, you just didn't look at somebody for three or four days, and then when you looked at each other, that meant it was over. But we never, well, it did, we never talked things out. We just, we just didn't know how to. Well, in Karen's family, you knew they were mad because they started yelling, and five minutes later, they're all crying and hugging each other. It's like, these people are crazy, you know, but it was much healthier than what I was raised in. How did your family resolve conflict? biblically, in a good, healthy way of talking things out and forgiving. I mean, if they did it correctly, then you probably do it correctly because you had a good role model. If they didn't do it correctly, you probably picked up on that, giving people a silent treatment, outburst of anger, intimidation, however they did it. The way your family handled money. Were they materialistic? Were they miserly? Were they givers? Were they 
You know, how, did they, how did they handle money? The way your father treated your mother. Was he sexist and chauvinist and demeaning of her? How did he treat her? Mother? The way your mother treated your father. Was she honoring or was she demeaning? Attitudes toward children and values in life. All of those things. Were they biblical? And if they were biblical, that means it was like this. If they were not biblical, it means they were like this. And you have a tendency then to do those same things. Okay. Number two, do you practice those same things? Were the things that you were influenced by growing up, were they correct and biblical and moral? Secondly, do you practice those same things? Because tendons, we, we basically do. We don't always do it, but we generally have that tendency to do it. The third thing is, have you ever dealt properly with the things that you viewed as wrong, things that are unbiblical, or maybe even abuse that you suffered while you're growing up. Have you ever dealt with that? And again, most of us haven't. And it's never too late. It doesn't matter how old you are. In just a few minutes, you can break the iniquities of your past off of your life. And let me tell you how you do this. The first is you just recognize the problem and call it what it is. Sometimes we have a tendency to get defensive of our family system. We really do. And, you know, we say, well, that's just the way that Evans is do it. Oh, let me say this. It doesn't matter if that's the way that Evans is do it. It matters if that's the way God does it. Okay? I love my family. I love my parents, my grandparents. I love all of my relatives. But my greatest loyalty is to God. Okay? So I'm not going to get defensive about it. And I'm just going to say, I was a chauvinist. When, when Karen and I got married, I was exposed to chauvinism. Really not my father as much as my grandfather and, and really that whole family system, my grandfather, you know, and I loved him uh, to death, but my grandfather was just showing us. And my grandmother just waited on him hand and foot. He never dialed the telephone for himself. He never did anything for himself. She cooked and cleaned and waited on him hand and foot. Uh, when he needed more coffee, literally, he could just reach over and thump his coffee cup. Nonverbal commands is the ultimate training for wives, is that... He, he literally would just reach over and thump his coffee cup, and she gave him more coffee. And I just thought, that's of the Lord, A. And B, I want one of them. And so, Karen, one time I thumped my tea glass, wanted more tea, and she said, I hope you're killing the fly, pal. I, <laughs> she didn't train well. But, well, I was a male chauvinist pig. And I thought that men were better than women. I had to, I had to call that what it was, it was a sin. I had a bent when we got married into believing that men were better than women, and which they're not. Men and women are completely equals. In Christ, there's neither male nor female. And that we are equals in marriage, and we're equals in life, and we're equals in Christ. And so I had to repent of the sin of chauvinism. So you just have to call it what it is. Secondly, you have to take responsibility for your behaviors. Listen, your parents or your grandparents may have done something wrong, but if you're doing it, it's just as wrong. It's just as wrong. So I'm going to take responsibility. Number three is I've got to forgive my mom and dad. I've got to forgive them. So a lot of times we, we want mercy for ourselves, but we don't want it for our moms and dads. And we understand the influences that affected us growing up, but we don't understand that our parents and grandparents, they had those same influences on them and sometimes even worse. My mother and father are better people than they should have been based on what they experienced growing up. They really are remarkable people when I look back on how they were. And so you have to forgive your mother and father. You have to forgive your mother and father. It's the biggest issue in being free from your past. In fact, you'll never be free from your past until you forgive your mother and father and just say, God bless them. Whether they're alive or dead, they may be dead. Bless them, God, and forgive them. I want mercy, and I give them mercy. And here's the fourth step in dealing with inner vows, and that is make Jesus the Lord of that area of your life. See, related to chauvinism in my life and being a workaholic is that it was just an area that wasn't submitted to the Lord. Is I was a Christian when I was a chauvinist. If I was a Christian. I woke up and prayed and read my Bible and went to church, but I was a, I was a male chauvinist pig. Why? It's because Jesus wasn't Lord of my life in that area. In the way that I treated Karen, I didn't, I didn't pray about it. I didn't ask the Lord how to deal with my wife. I was not reading the Bible and doing what the Bible was saying in that particular area. If you're bent, there's only one way to get straight, and that is the influence of Jesus Christ. How does Jesus want you to deal with anger? How does Jesus want you to deal with money? How does Jesus want you to deal with values and priorities and peer pressure and sexual temptation and, and substances and all of those things? You go to him and say, Jesus, I surrender this to you, and I pray 
that you would heal me in this area. And I break this iniquity off of my life. I call it what it is. I repent of it. I take responsibility for my behavior. I forgive my mother and father or anybody who is responsible for this in my life. And I break this off of my life. And what happens is just like that. They'll be broken off your life. You still have to deal with behaviors after that, but something happens spiritually. If we don't deal with it properly, we're just going to have a bent uh, just like our parents were. We're going we're to be like them typically. But there's another thing that's called an inner vow. And this is a, a self-directed promise that we make to ourselves in response to difficulty or pain. It's a self-comforting thing. You know, it would be great when you're growing up. I wish, I wish you know, and the Lord was certainly with me when I was growing up. But I didn't know the Bible. I didn't know how to deal with pain. So um, I didn't. I stuffed a lot of pain in my life. And the other thing is I, I made inner vows. Um, and I, I've never met a person that had never made an inner vow. I think every person at some point has made one. Something difficult is going on. We're in a difficult circumstance. And we make ourselves these little promises. And, so, you know, an example is I'll never treat my children like that. I'll never spank my children. I'll never make my kids wear hand-me-downs. I wore hand-me-downs all my life. I'll never make my kids work. I'll never be poor again. I'll never be. It's a comforting thing when you're going through pain to tell yourself, I'm not coming back here. No one is ever going to hurt me again. And see, when you're really going through a difficult circumstance, a divorce or you know, a difficult uh, problem where someone's really hurt you, we, we say that to ourselves. No one's ever going to hurt me again. I'll never let my wife or husband treat me like that. When I get older, I'm not going to go to church every time the door opens. You know, I'm not going to shove religion down my kid's throat. Whatever we say. And there's many, many ways that we comfort ourselves. And the problem is, is Jesus calls it evil. It's interesting. Twice the Bible calls these evil. Matthew 5, this is what Jesus said. Again, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but you shall perform your oaths to the Lord. But I say to you, do not swear at all. Neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, nor by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Nor shall you swear by your head, because you cannot make one hair white or black, but let your yes be yes and your no be no, for whatever is more than this is of the evil one. Jesus says, you don't go around swearing things. You don't swear by God. And you know, some people say, I swear to God. He said, don't do that. Don't, you don't go around swearing. You don't swear by things or people or heaven or earth. When you say yes, let your yes be yes, or no be no, because anything more than that is of the evil one. See, when we make ourselves a self-promise, we're promising, we're vowing to ourselves. I promised myself this is not going to happen. He said, you can't do that. You can't do that. James 4, come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go and do such thing and go to a, such a city, spend a year there, buy and sell and make a profit. Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. But now you boast in your arrogance and all such boasting is evil. You say, I'll never be poor again. Really? Really? No one's ever going to hurt me again. Really? Here's what happens. When you make yourself a promise, you become God in that area. I'm, I'm taking my life over. I'm saying I am God of my finances. And I'm saying right now, no one's, I'm never going to be poor again. I am God in that area. No one's ever going to hurt me again. I am God in the area of my finances. I'm telling you right now, it's never going to happen to me again. And James says, you don't talk about like, life like that. You don't know what's going to happen. That's an arrogant thing to do. And of course, when we're kids and we're growing up, we don't know. You know, we don't, we don't know. We're not trying to be evil or do something like that. But let me say this. In any area of your life that you have an inner vow operating right now, Jesus is not the Lord of that area. And that's why he says it's evil. Because it takes us away from him. And so that's, that's what the Lord wants me to do. Inner vows prohibit normal learning and growth and cause extremes. Okay, so your kids are growing up, or you're growing up, and you get spanked. And you say, I'll never spank my kids. You, know, you should never beat your children. Proverbs twenty two fifteen says, folly is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of discipline drives it far from him. And you see some family that abuse their children and beat their children, which is wrong, and others that don't discipline their children. And much of that is either an iniquity or it's an inner vow. But what it does is it causes extremes. Now, let me say this. You know, what you see a lot of times in family systems is one extreme going to the other. 
is this, this family doesn't discipline their children, and then this family over here, they're legalistic and they abuse their children or whatever. It's like a drunk man trying to get on a horse. When you have, when you have iniquities and inner vows going on, what you'll find in family systems is one extreme to the other extreme to the other extreme. When you break iniquities and inner vows off of your life, you sober up, you can get on the horse and ride in the future. Until you break them off your life, you're going to live your life in extremes because it causes an extreme. I'll never be poor again. So you're a materialist. Congratulations. That's what happens. If I make myself a vow that I'll never be poor again, I'm going to become a materialist. I have a wrong relationship with money. And so our, my children grow up underneath the influence of that, and they may renounce money because they see the damage that it's done in their life, in your life, and that you were never there. So now they're going to go to the other extreme, extreme to extreme. Inner vows have a railroad track effect on your life. You don't even know that it's guiding you, but it's guiding you. And so you don't even know that it's there, but it's there. It's silently guiding your life. And they are our highest loyalty. Inner vows are our highest loyalty in life. If I don't do anything else, I'm going to do what I promised myself I was going to do. Uh, in any area that you have an inner vow, you're a little crazy. And, and in that area, you're unteachable. And, and you're, not, you know, you're not completely sane. You're just not. We go to extremes in those areas. How do you break inner vows? Number one, you ask the Holy Spirit to show them to you. Holy Spirit, is, is there an inner vow in my life? And some, Sometimes we forget because there's, because there's pain attached to it. Sometimes we forget about it. But we can just ask the Holy Spirit, is there an inner vow in my life? Is there something I promised myself back when that I need to break? Number two is you repent to God and say, God, I'm sorry. I didn't know, honestly, because we don't know any better. I mean, you know, we don't know any better. God knows that, but we do now. And we realize the negative effect. Let me, let me give you an example of this. If you've been through bad relationships, let's just say you've been a bad, through a, a bad marriage in the past, and you say to yourself, no one's ever going to hurt me again. Did you know the worst abusers in marriage are the people that have inner vows in their lives? The most abusive man I've ever counseled in marriage grew up under a very, very domineering mother. And he saw his mother emasculate his father every day. And he said to himself, I will never let a woman treat me like that. And let me just tell you something. He humiliated and dominated every woman in his life. Because he had made a vow. No woman's ever going to do that to me. So he went to the, like a drunk man on a horse. He goes to the other extreme. His father was docile. Now he is a woman hater. And we repent and say, God, I repent. I repent of this inner vow and for taking that area of my life away from you. And here's the biggie. Here's number three. You got to forgive that person. Ex-husband, ex-wife, ex-business partner, friend, you know, someone who cheated on you, someone who hurt you, your parents, your, your brothers and sisters, your whatever, whoever it was. Lord, I forgive that person because again, you just, you're never going to be free from it until you forgive. And so you forgive that individual. You bring that issue to Jesus and you say, Lord, I repent of making that inner vow. And Lord, now I just pray in this area, teach me how. Teach me how to deal with money. Teach me how to treat people. Well, I hope this teaching today was a blessing to you. You know, this teaching today is part of a fuller seminar that I do called Marriage on the Rock. And Marriage on the Rock is a 10-part seminar and in that seminar, we just talk about the foundational issues of marriage that, that saved our marriage, literally. When Karen and I were on the brink of divorce, this is the information that saved our marriage. And so we want to get this information into your hands. What you saw today is just a very small part of the full seminar. First of all, for your gift of any amount right now to support the ministry and mission of marriage today, we want to send you the CD single called The Most Important Issue in Marriage. And it is the most important issue in marriage. We'll send it to you right away for your gift of any amount. For your gift of $50 or more, we want to send you the full CD seminar, 10-part seminar, Marriage on the Rock, plus the Marriage on the Rock book. For your gift of $110 or more, we'll send you the full seminar on DVD, plus the Marriage on the Rock book, plus our book, Happy, Happy Love. And Happy, Happy Love is just a fun book. It's a very romantic book. Put the spice back into your relationship, kind of the passion and intimacy Maybe if you've lost some of that, it'll just help you to get it back. All of these resources are marriage-saving, marriage-building resources. We want to get this to you to help you, to bless you. Maybe even if you're single or divorced, 
get these and prepare for your next marriage. But we want to get these into your hands. Here's how you can get them. Marriage on the Rock, the best-selling book and series, is the essential resource to having the marriage of your dreams. Through this power-packed series, marriage expert Jimmy Evans will show you how to deal with real-life challenges and offer easy-to-understand solutions that will transform your relationship. Jimmy will address all the major issues a couple will encounter, like communication, finances, sex, kids, his and her needs, blended families, and much more. For your gift of any amount, you'll receive the CD single, The Most Important Issue in Marriage. For your gift of $50 or more, we'll send you the Marriage on the Rock book and CD series. For your gift of $110 or more, you'll receive the book and DVD series, plus the passion reigniting Happy Happy Love book. Discover God's design for your dream marriage. Whether you've been married for years or just preparing for the journey, experience Marriage on the Rock today. As I said in the teaching, you know, I've never seen a person that didn't have uh, iniquities in their vows. I've just never seen it. Karen and I both had, you know, many. And it was something that was holding us literally in bondage in our lives. And we just didn't realize the power of an iniquity within our families that had not been recognized and broken. And, you know, this was over 40 years ago that we heard this teaching and that we responded to it personally. And I'm telling you, it immediately and dramatically made an impact within our lives when we stopped and said, Lord, we recognize these generational sins, the, the impact of the behavior that we were raised within. We recognize it. We forgive our parents. We forgive our parents for and, and anyone in our families that said or did anything to hurt us, which is critical. It's, it's the most important issue in being set free from your past. We have to get to that place. We forgive moms and dads, stepmoms, stepdads, you know, ex-spouses, siblings, anyone who hurt us in our past. We forgive them. Then we take this area to God and we say, Lord, we surrender this to you. We make you Lord now of this area where we had the iniquity in, of this area where we made this inner vow in response to our past in response to the negative issues of our past. Lord, we pray right now in the name of Jesus, and I'm praying this over you right now, that the power of this iniquity is now broken over our lives forever and over our children and grandchildren, that no longer will this iniquity be passed from generation to generation, and no longer will this iniquity negatively affect my life and my marriage. I break it in Jesus' name, and Lord, I surrender this to you and pray that I, you now will teach me in this area that I've had this bent, that you'll teach me so that now this area will straighten up so I'll be blessed and my marriage will be blessed and the past will no longer affect the present in a negative way. And I renounce the inner vow. In response to pain, I made a vow to myself and I realize the damage is done. I now break that vow. I forgive everyone who hurt me and I now bring this area to you, Lord, and I say, teach me. In this area that I've been unteachable, in this area that I have really you know, been responding and reacting for so many years, now teach me in this area. And here's what I'm saying to you, he will. And it will make a dramatic impact in your life. And I know that many of you that are watching this program right now, I mean, you have iniquities or you have had iniquities and inner vows, but I agree with you right now that they're broken. I agree with right now that you have forgiven the people of your past. This is a surrendered area to the Lord. And I can tell you that the power of the devil that he's been using against you is broken off of this area. You're going to be a different person. And as you begin to be a different person, all inner vows are renounced. All iniquities are broken. It is going to change you, your marriage, and your family for generations. This is a powerful thing. What it means is the parents of our past are no longer, whatever mistakes they made, are no longer affecting us every day. So I hope that this is a blessing to you. And uh, I thank you for tuning in today. And I wanna say this, you know, we're, we're with you right now because of our partners who help to support this ministry. And if you're not a partner right now, a monthly partner, I'm asking you to become a rock solid partner. You get special blessings and special resources that only our partners get. And so I'm asking you right now, if you would consider 
becoming a monthly partner and helping us here at Marriage Today to take this message, the message that you heard today, plus all the other information and resources we have, help us to take it to a world in need. Become a partner with us, and here's how you can do it. We all enter into marriage confident a happy, fulfilling life is in front of us. Over time, life's journeys can quickly deflate those expectations and we're left feeling like we've fallen out of love. But with the right information and a mutual commitment to success, a better marriage is possible. Become a rock-solid partner and gain instant access to practical marriage help in topics ranging from communication, needs, and intimacy, as well as blended families, intentional dating, spiritual health, and much more. Marriage Today exists to help every person succeed in marriage. With your help, we can continue raising a standard for marriage and reverse the curse of family breakup in order to rebuild the nations one home at a time. That's why we're tied into the ministry. We want to be able to bless and give so they can keep doing what they're doing. There's just millions of marriages that need help, and if this is a way we can help facilitate that, then that's a great way to spend some money. We love Jimmy and Karen, and we love learning more about how uh, to be a better couple and how to help other couples like they do. Become a rock-solid partner with the ministry and mission of Marriage Today. Subscribe to Marriage Today's YouTube channel for more marriage-building videos and updates.